think everyone's got this VM up right now. All right, I'm just going to have you start the thing up. We're probably not going to get to it for quite a while, but <clears throat> at least in the previous class, uh, we were having issues where the zone alarm firewall that's installed wouldn't allow you network access until it had been sitting there for a while. So at the thing, rather than pressing play, let's do the revert to snapshot, which is this double backwards arrow. And that should get you into the saved state where it was sort of, so originally the point was, well, and if it says there's different features, just go ahead and hit yes. So originally the point was to get you into a saved state. Uh, the point of running VMware server is that had you downloaded this and just uh, pressed play to start it up, it would have got you into the saved uh, VM state where there's no pad open and there's debug view open and stuff like that. Uh, this was because there were some changes, you know, there was not as many as I would have liked, but there was at least one change here where if you would have uh, restarted the VM before you had uh, looked with appropriate tools, you wouldn't have seen uh, the change that was made to the system. It's not actually a malicious change because, like I said, I was having uh, some issues with conflicting kids where they would uh, not want to play well with each other. Surprise, surprise. So we're just going to let that sit so that by the time we get around to it, it should uh, be prompting you to uh, let you access the network. Sorry, sorry about that. All right. So the initial theme of this is check yourself before you wreck yourself. All right, so here's the Ice Cube lyrics, and I didn't know any of the further of the lyrics other than the uh, other than the refrain here to check yourself before you wreck yourself. But when I looked into it, you can see that uh, clearly, is it again? Ice Cube. Yes, Ice Cube is a uh, is singing this from the perspective of a rootkit, but he's advocating for uh, anti rootkit detection. So he's perspective of rootkit because he says he's bad for your health and he comes real stealth. But if you know the correct places to search for rootkits, you'll find them. All right. So um, like my previous classes, this is going to be all Creative Commons. So all of these slides will be public released. All right. So I have a few people in here that haven't had my classes before. So just to say a little bit about myself, I'm a generalist. I consider myself computer security generalist, not a specialist, although over the last couple of years I've been focusing on worst-based security type things because I feel that you know there's plenty of people who know network-based security, but there's not enough people who know deep host-based security and we're left with you know network-based uh, intrusion detection systems which have known problems where they can't find, you know, they can't inspect encrypted content and all that. So uh, it was an interesting way that I got into looking at rootkits, it was because I was working on a project, uh, the MITRE Honey Client project, which is a client-side honeypot where the point was a normal honeypot, the attacker comes to you, they break into your system, and the system has no point except to be broken into. And with a client honeypot or honey client, uh, it just runs around spidering the web, going to websites, waiting for them to break into the client just by, by viewing the website. And so I had done the uh, kernel monitoring component for that. It was basically just, uh, the problem was they had been using uh, basically just scripts that would check the file system, check the registry, and those were taking forever. And so I integrated a third party thing called Capture, which was, which used some kernel uh, monitoring capabilities in order to see all the file system activity, all the process activity, on all the registry activity. and. One of the people on the project had kept misdescribing that monitoring of the system as a rootkit. He kept saying, yeah, we've got a rootkit installed on the system, and, and that's how we're watching everything that happens. And so uh, someone else who was shopping around an idea for uh, hiding a detection system uh, had come to me and said, hey, I hear you know about rootkits. And I was like, well, OK, first of all, that thing that you were told was a rootkit, that's not a rootkit. But yes, I've been paying attention to rootkits off to the side for a while. All right, and then uh, Xeno is made, mostly made of uh, four elements, and every living thing is mostly made of four elements. Uh, plants, bugs, birds, bees, bacteria, and men are mostly carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. That's to keep me humble and keep you humble. <laughs> 
you're not so complicated. You're mostly four elements, and you're mostly empty space by volume. All right, so this is our agenda. Uh, less, more thing in less sections, essentially, here, unlike the previous classes, where I filled up all four sections. Um, so the miscellaneous for this class, like the other classes, is when you have a question, ask it immediately. Just you know, don't even bother raising your hand. Just shout out question and go for it. Uh, it's important to ask your questions as soon as you have it. Uh, otherwise, if you get lost, you know, I understand that some people will, you know, if you have a question, you'll just sort of try to think about it and puzzle it out. You think that you know additional context will help you. Uh, Will help you understand it, but uh, definitely in this sort of class, we keep moving fast, we keep going low level, so it's important to ask questions, even if it's just to reiterate uh, what you think I just said. <coughs> and as with the other classes, browsing the web and checking email is a great way to get lost here. Uh, I, I frequently have in other classes, you know, the one person who, you know, they're trying to attend the class, but they're busy, and and then they're uh, you know, just checking email throughout the entire class and. And then they end up coming multiple years in a row. So we're going to go with uh, two hours here at the beginning, and then a 10-minute break, and then two hours to lunch, and then one hour breaks thereafter. So while I've got your energy and attention, we're going to try to push forward and get through a lot of material. All right, so what is the point of this class? So as opposed to some of the previous classes, which are a lot of background material which leads up into this class, the exploits class, the reverse engineering class. They're, they were sort of more fundamentals and you know that they didn't have a large component of uh, hands-on material to it. So, one of, so the point of this class was to try to take some of this background material and start applying it practically. So that's one of the big reasons why I wanted you to first uh, have hands-on experience before class because still there's a ton of material I have to get through. Uh, in order to, to feel I've given you an adequate, uh, even just a breadth, uh, breadth first uh, search of the material. So, so having come in, played with the tools, you know, just whatever you got off of Google, that's good to get you thinking about um, what type of stuff you might see. I mean, most people through most tools would have caught Hacker Defender and, and potentially Vanquish. Uh, Vanquish was sort of half installed. It was installed, but it was broken because Hacker Defender and Vanquish were sort of fighting over who got to hook what. And so I think most of you would have seen that Vanquish was uh, not even hiding itself in, in the main VM. I think if you restarted, it might have fixed itself in some cases, and then Vanquish might have disappeared. Uh, but, but that was one of the things I was trying to go for with the uh, if you restart, system will change. I was originally trying to get Vanquish running because I knew if I install Vanquish and then I install Hacker Defender, if I restart, Vanquish breaks. But then sometimes if you restart again, Vanquish starts working. So, anyways, uh, you already had a little bit of hands-on experience from doing the homework, and so now we're basically going to go through and say, you know, here are the tools I recommend due to you know their enhanced detection capability. They're looking in more places than these other tools. And, and so you'll be able to see more of the stuff we talk in the class. Um, yeah, so that, that speaks to the uh, sense of what you learned from the tools. And also, this is going to reinforce what we learned in previous classes for those who had them. Uh, it'll definitely, these first few things we're going to talk about where we say, you know, run this tool, see these results. We're then going to say, you know, this result relates back to intermediate x86. This result relates back to life of binaries, things like that. Yep, and so unfortunately in this class I'm not going to have a lot of time to get into things like attribution of changes. But, you know, so I said in the, for the homework I wanted, you know, what changes were made maliciously to the system, uh, what caused the change, and how can you remove it. On the what caused the change side of things, there were various ways you could approach that. You could do something like, you know, trying to remove stuff, and if a change goes away, okay, well that file is related to that change. So, so that's like the first order attribution of changes which you could go for. Uh, some of them get much more complicated and they require actually going in, looking at the location that's being targeted by a change, and then starting reverse engineering the actual assembly at that location. And we're not going to have enough time to get into that. <clears throat> but um, I do have some examples of that written up 
So one of the class materials that I'm going to be distributing is got a couple class materials. So you're going to get the um, you're going to get all the slides. You're going to get a um, Excel file that has a comparison of different rootkit detectors and what they do and don't detect. So this was sort of useful exercise to go through. So here's a bunch of different uh, types of changes that I potentially see. And then here's a bunch of uh, rootkit detectors or things like WinDebug and whether or not they, you know, green is detects it. And I was very generous here in detection in, in that I said it, it detects it even if you have to know specifically what you're looking for. And that's why WinDebug gets high green marks because in some cases there is no way to do to find something other than to go in, debug the system, and look specifically, did they change this data structure on this list somewhere. But uh, virus block ADA is a uh, newer anti-rootkit tool, which I'll talk about later. But that one, I found that like the Friday before the previous class. I mean, virus block ADA was the company which found Stuxnet actually, and so they've since then they've been uh, bootstrapping this anti-rootkit tool in order to, uh, you know, so they can really claim uh, expertise in rootkit detection. Right? We found Stuxnet, and here's our super awesome rootkit detector. Prior to that, uh, I was, uh, Gmer was my favorite due to some of its removal capability and it had reasonably broad detection capability. But, uh, but VBA basically uh, is surpassing that now, especially in the removal area. So the blue is, sorry, the green is just detects it. Blue is detects it and can potentially roll back changes. So when I was talking about how can you remove changes to the system, some of these tools can roll back the changes where the changes are something that should be one fixed value, and if you change it away from that fixed value, then they can say, well, I know what this should be, so they can roll it back, and you can do that without rebooting in many cases. Now, it may blue screen your system in some cases, but uh, it at least has the capability. So that's another material uh, you're going to have in this class, and so you can go out and, you know, find those tools and play with them as well. And then the other thing is a uh, tiddly wiki, which is a sort of standalone let me have it open. It's a standalone little JavaScript in a standalone file. And uh, where I was going was I have some examples here of reverse engineering rootkit changes. So say ambiguous GMA report one, it says, okay, here's a bunch of changes that we see on the system. And it's saying, you know, this particular entry points at that address. But it's not telling you what module that address pertains to because it turns out that's on dynamically allocated memory uh, in the kernel heap, essentially. And so it's like someone allocated memory on the heap and they put some code there and this points to that code. But the question is, is that good guy code or bad guy code? It turns out in this case it's good guy code, but uh, the point of this is to show how you have to look at the things. So we say, you know, attach a debugger, investigate the memory location, and then here is how you actually have to reverse engineer it. So we can't get into this level of depth. This was going to be an example for the reverse engineering class that's in May. Uh, we decided that this was too in-depth for intro reversing, so maybe an advanced group kits class in the future, maybe an advanced uh, uh, advanced reverse engineering class, probably not the malware class, which is going to follow on to the reverse engineering class. So you'll have that as well, and also useful is uh, getting a VM set up. This is sort of like instructor materials for uh, since I make these available, I want you know other people to be able to recreate the classes. But uh, this is useful in that you can see all the bat file that I executed in order to install all of the uh, various things. So I removed a couple of things which were conflicting and causing crashes and stuff. So there's a couple of rootkits that were going to be in this class. They were causing crashes. I removed them from this. Uh, you'll potentially see them in a future sort of optional just activity thing, not a homework or anything, but. I'm going to put out a VM after the third class in June where it's going to be a little more uh, stealthy installation of something. So this VM, the intent was just scattershot, install as many rootkits as possible. And the next VM is going to be, you know, how can we make it a little more stealthy? And it'll still be using techniques from this class, but uh, perhaps their persistence mechanisms and things like that will be less obvious and therefore not, you know, point immediately at specific files. So that's another uh, of the class materials you're going to get at the end. And so I'm gonna, when I distribute the class materials, I don't want them given out to anyone. I don't want you talking about the 
the class with anyone who's going to be in future class. So we've got, we've had just now, uh, we had one McLean section, we're having this section, and then there's going to be, uh, there were too many people registered, so there's going to be another section in June. So you know, if anyone comes sniffing around, uh, talking about, you know, hey, hey, how is that Root Kids class? I mean, if your manager is, they're probably not going to be in the June section. But if someone from McLean comes sniffing around, saying, you know, hey, what'd you learn in the Root Kids class? You might want to consult with me as to whether they're in the class. All right. <coughs> so, like I was saying, we're not going to be able to get into, you know, deep attribution, which is definitely necessary in some cases. But like I said, first order attribution is often just go ahead and remove some file that you think might be causing the change if the change goes away. Okay. That's responsible. All right. So, we want to talk a little bit about the textbook here. Uh, you all got a free textbook for this. If you already have this textbook, Please uh, give it back to the Miter Institute so they can just forward it on to the McLean class. I know some people already have this. But I want to talk about the pros and cons of various textbooks here quick. Uh, so 2005, this one, Root Kits by Greg Coglin and Jamie Butler. Uh, the pros of that book were that uh, it's written by Coglin and Butler, who are two of the people who were contributing a lot to the early techniques of Windows Root Kits specifically. Um, but the con of it is that it's starting to show its age and it doesn't, it's not particularly broad and it's missing uh, many newer techniques and things like that. Um, also, in some cases, they're definitely coming at it from an OS internals perspective. So they assume you're someone who's, you know, already uh, understands things about how Windows and OS works. And so if you don't know that sort of thing, it kind of goes a little fast into some of that material. That said, that book, when combined with the Windows internals book by Microsoft, is uh, definitely works good to complement each other. Uh, 2007, Professional Rootkits. This one, the good part about it is that it builds up an increasing capability rootkit. So they start with, you know, just a very simple thing, and then they, keep, they add network, and they add, you know, hiding registry and stuff like that. Uh, so it's good in that it builds up as it goes through the class. And also, it specifically has a code base, and it shows a lot of the code as you go along, and it shows what they added and things like that. Uh, but the cons is that it basically adds nothing new to the field. It's just reiterating uh, stuff that's out there. And also, the types of things that they're using in this book is not necessarily the most stealthy of techniques. They're just sort of the, I, I would say there are the more stable techniques, but not necessarily the more stealthy ones. So it's. Professional Rootkits is a good name. It's, it's from a professional whatever series, but <clears throat> Professional Rootkits is a good name in the sense that uh, it can be used to make, you know, Rootkit functionality built into commercial software, like when there was the Sony Rootkit where Sony had DRM that hid files in order to try to prevent you from, you know, copying the CDs or whatever it was doing. Uh, that type of thing is exactly the kind of stuff that uh, this book talks about. So if you were someone who is, you know, charged with DRM create, uh, creation, you might use techniques from this book. So this is what we eventually went with for the class. Um, Rootkit's arsenal. The good thing about it is that it covers more things than the Hugland Butler book. It covers all the same stuff that the Hugland Butler does, but it covers more things and it does cover it uh, with an eye to Windows Vista compatibility. Uh, it comes with a lot of code, but the code is something that, at least last time I checked, someone can correct me if they find otherwise, but last time I checked, you're not allowed to actually go download this code anywhere. It's all just in that appendix at the end, and so you have to, like, type it up again, which is kind of pointless. It's like, you know, does he really think that he's, uh, you know, saving the world by writing out a bunch of rootkit code and then saying, aha, but only the attackers who type it up will be able to use this. Well, I think really uh, just stopping defenders from playing with it as well. Um, yeah, so I still have this in here. I need to go really nail that down. The first time I looked through this book, I was not particularly hot on it because um, I immediately found an example which to me looked like it was plagiarized from somewhere else. Uh, I have not been able to refine that, so since this is going on the internet, I will not officially claim there's plagiarism until I actually go find the exact code. <coughs> but uh, 
But yeah, definitely in some, I remember at least in some cases there were things like uh, in the C code, normally when you're dereferencing a pointer uh, in order to access a structure field, you'd use, you know, like the arrow sign dash and greater than sign. And all of this code is sort of rewritten in that it uses star and dot, which is the exact same thing, but using two operators instead of quote one. And that was kind of one of the things where I, I remember the first thing I saw, I went and I looked at this rootkit.com file and there was the dash one and then I went and looked at these things and it was star dot. So anyways. All right, so it's sort of a pro and sort of a con here in that this book also, the author comes not from an OS background like Hoglin and Butler, but from a forensics background. So sort of thinking about, well, you know, he was tasked, he was a forensic investigator, he was tasked with, you know, finding the rootkit files on a compromised system post-analysis, right, not on a running system. And so he comes at it from a slightly different perspective and so you get actually some extra material in there for anti-forensics and how you would actually hide on a uh, dead system. But I kind of consider anti-forensics its own entire field. So, I mean, that's good if you've never seen anti-forensics stuff, but otherwise it just kind of feels like it's padding out the book. So between the appendix and the anti-forensic stuff, the book ends up not being super much bigger than uh, the Hubble and Butler book. <coughs> All right, finally, uh, 2010, there was Hacking Exposed from the Hacking Exposed series, Malware Rootkits. Uh, it's good in that it's up-to-date reference, and it specifically it's good in that it talks about lots of in-the-wild stuff. So they talk about Mebroot and Rustock and other, you know, named malware families that are in the wild. Uh, it does, you know, a good job in that, well, so rootkits, I don't know why I would put this as a con. It, I guess the pro is that it does a decent job of talking about uh, the general techniques. I would say it doesn't talk about them to the depth of the Hoglin Butler book. But the con is that it actually is still not a lot of material. It's only like 120 pages. So there's still a lot of just general malware uh, to the book. And it's only it's about that thick. So again, it's thinner than this. It's uh, and only like 120 pages plus 34 detection. And I, the big con I considered was that when they talk about detection, a lot of it is sort of that unactionable, like, you know, always verify your system files and stuff like that. Uh, and the other con is that there wasn't source code. So overall, I went with this uh, Rootkit's Arsenal book because there's source code, it's broad, and uh, that's the primary reason, I guess. Okay, so what is a Rootkit, but more importantly, how do I define a Rootkit for this class? So it's definitely an overused term and it's misapplied to a lot of places. But for this class purpose, we consider it an attacker tool where it's not how they get root, it's not how they break into a system, but it's how once they're in the system, they hide themselves. So they've compromised root or, you know, they've just compromised the system and they want to maintain their privileges on the system, maintain access to the system and hide themselves on the system. So I, I did sort of like this uh, Greg Hogland's definition from his 1999 track article where he says that uh, Rootkit is a program which programs which patch and Trojan existing execution paths within the system. This violates the integrity of the trusted computing base. So it definitely is the case that a lot of the uh, Rootkit attacks focus on integrity level attacks. So therefore when we go to detection, uh, doing file integrity, <coughs> memory integrity, things like that, we'll find a lot of the Rootkit things. Um, and even some of, the, some of the other techniques, which are arguably not necessarily integrity-based, they still kind of fall along the lines of semantic integrity, meaning they may not be just, you know, this value should be this, and if it's ever different, that's bad. It can be things like this list should have the same number of elements as this list. And so the way the operating system uses these lists, the integrity condition is that, you know, they have the same number of elements or something like that. So a lot of, uh, a lot of, there, it's sort of, uh, a lot of it is about hiding, a lot of it is about integrity attacks, and uh, to a lesser degree, a lot of it is about persisting on the system. So I think in, in, a, in a different uh, forum, I had, I had focused on there's hooking, hiding, and, uh, and persistence. But, all right, so there's two sort of uh, taxonomies here. The first one is, uh, ring-based, and so we, as we talked about in the intermediate x86 class, uh, we know that 
Rings are sort of privilege levels on the operating system. And so ring three is user space, it's the least privileged, and ring zero is kernel space, and that's the most privileged. But then there are these, uh, well, so, and for purposes of rootkits, this sort of <coughs> talks about what level of privilege the attacker has. So there are user space rootkits where they don't actually need to compromise the kernel, uh, things like that. User space rootkits typically rely on things like processing uh, DLL injection where they, for every process that's at the same privilege as you, uh, they can just inject code into it through various Windows mechanisms. And, uh, and then they can just use API hooking, uh, either inline or import address table. They just use hooking within the thing in order to redirect control flow to say, you know, if you try to read the file system, they're going to intercept that and hide files. And so they can do that entirely at the user space level. They need not necessarily go to kernel. Uh, kernel level is obviously, you know, the attacker would like to be as privileged as possible so that the security tools uh, don't have more privilege than the attacker. And so they can attack the security tools. And so uh, kernel based is sort of the common one. I don't know what, whether you'd say which is more common in the wild, but. Um, but that's definitely what we're going to focus a lot on in this class. So ring negative one is that in x86, uh, they added the support for a uh, hardware support for virtualization. And that's sometimes talked about as if it were ring negative one because uh, when you add in a hypervisor, you know, to virtualize an OS, that hypervisor is more privileged than the OS, the guest OS that it's controlling. Uh, and therefore, it's sort of like a ring native one, right? If ring zero is more privileged than three, if you're going towards lower numbers <coughs> to get more privilege, then uh, ring negative one is, is more privileged than zero. So a hypervisor is more privileged, and there's been good uh, talks that focus on <coughs> either compromising an existing hypervisor or adding a hypervisor where there was none in order to get the attacker into a position where they're <coughs> more privileged. How do you ring? Right, so the negative rings are not real rings in the sense of segmentation or anything we learned about in the intermediate x86 class. Ring negative one, it's just sort of, you know, Intel added in hardware and they don't, I don't think they officially call it ring negative one everywhere, anywhere, but the point is when you go into the manuals and you look at, you know, how everything gets set up, the support for hard, the hardware support for virtualization is such that it makes it so that even code which is running ring zero will still be intercepted by this hypervisor code. It can intercept instructions and it can control the memory access of the ring zero code. So ring negative one is the closest thing to a real actual ring here. It's just sort of a de facto ring negative one because when Intel added hardware support, they put a layer underneath the ring zero. All the rest of these are just sort of notional terms and they're just for taxonomy purposes to say, Here's where things are lower, lower, lower. You know, it's in between these levels inside of this privilege. So sort of the point is, uh, no, no matter where you are, the lower you are, the more everything else above it you can subvert, right? So by going to ring zero, you subvert all the ring three process. So if there's a security software in ring three, but you're ring zero, uh, they don't really have any hope of you know manipulating you or detecting you or anything like that. If you go to ring negative one, uh, then maybe it's much more difficult for uh, ring zero code to actually be touched. All right, so ring negative 1.5, which is just a term that I'm making up for purposes of this class to give a little more fine granularity. Um, ring negative 1.5 can be something like a master boot record infecting rootkit. So a master boot record is the first sector of your hard drive and it's code where after the BIOS is done loading, it grabs the first sector of your hard drive. So because it's immediately post BIOS, but pre OS and pre hypervisor, you know, let's say you have a hypervisor which starts at boot up. You've got like a thin uh, bare metal hypervisor. You're running ESX or something like that. Um, still, your BIOS is going to run. It's going to grab the master boot record. It's going to start executing it. Then it's going to execute potentially the partition boot record. And then maybe eventually it'll, it'll kick off ESX. So with either an OS or a hardware uh, uh, bare metal hypervisor, in either case, the master boot record always runs first. And so in these uh, bootkit type attacks that we'll talk about later, uh, the attacker sort of uh, hops his way through memory in order to compromise things at the time that they get loaded. 
so that he could you know, manipulate your OS before you start the code of the OS, and he can manipulate, you know, if you have a bare metal hypervisor, same thing, it's really functionally equivalent. He can just manipulate it before it actually kicks off. And so similarly, so I put DMA in there. I've been sort of moving this around in my slides. I just changed it right here. So DMA is direct memory access. This is where <coughs> peripherals can uh, reach out and speak to the north bridge, which is the chip which uh, mediates all access to RAM. So even the CPU has to talk to this north bridge to talk to RAM. Similarly, other devices, for instance, on the PCI bus or Firewire bus are allowed to, to go talk to that same north bridge to access memory. And so any peripheral which has DMA access can potentially be ring zero. I mean, it, I guess you could think of it as ring three as well, but it's most likely to be, you can think of it like ring zero, ring negative one, or ring negative 1.5. And that means it can go up to ring negative 1.5 if and only if something like uh, Intel VTD is not being used. This VTD is their code name for, uh, what is it, IO, MMU, Input Output Memory Management Unit. It's sort of a capability where you can lock down and restrict access to certain portions of memory. So in a proper, um, in a proper configuration or proper, I don't know, in a properly designed hypervisor, the hypervisor should be using something like DTD in order to lock down its own memory so that it says external peripherals may not write to the hypervisor memory. Right? And that's to protect it from stuff like DMA where if someone you know, plugs in a firewire device, firewire can, you know, just speak directly out to the north bridge. And so there were a bunch of attacks uh, talked about since around 2004 where, you know, if someone puts Linux on an iPod, they stick it into, you know, they, they plug it in via FireWire, that Linux OS on the iPod can speak over FireWire and directly access the memory of the system, the, the physical memory. And that physical memory gets mapped to virtual memory. And that virtual memory can be being used for you know, user space processes, the OS itself. And, uh, or a hypervisor. So if your little iPod can uh, reach out and rewrite any of the hypervisor memory, that means it's functionally more privileged than ring negative one, right? But if the hypervisor is uh, being correct and locking it down saying no one may ever use DMA to access my memory, well then, uh, you know, the attacker may only be ring zero uh, privileges in terms of what they can modify. Similarly, an OS can use VTD in order to lock out, um, you know, say there's no virtualization in play, an OS can lock out a uh, peripheral from writing to its own memory, but if it's not, then functionally the DMA access is at ring negative one because it didn't change anything in the kernel. So that's where I'm putting that right now, and, and it definitely is a caveated thing. It all depends on whether these things like VTD are actually being used, which, uh, I guess Zen does use it, for instance, in order to lock down the hypervisor memory space. But I don't know about other things like uh, VMware. I think it does, but I'm not sure. All right. So system management <coughs> mode is a dedicated mode of the x86 processor where uh, it's meant to be used for uh, system management type events, meaning Things like you've got a little heat sensor on the uh, on the motherboard, and so when it fires off an interrupt saying, "Hey, the, the CPU is getting too hot," there's some code which is supposed to handle that immediately, turn on the fans, and let the system resume. And so that that's one of the the intentions for use of system management mode. Uh, it's handled that sort of thing. The thing is, system management mode is sort of privileged in the sense that people are calling it ring negative two because. Um, the code which executes in system management mode is allowed to be locked down. So there's, when uh, when the BIOS is executing, it basically puts some code in a memory region and says, I'm going to treat this like the SMM code, and then it's going to execute whenever this certain system management interrupt occurs. And when the BIOS does that, it can also set a register that says, lock this memory down, and no one should ever be allowed to access it except the SMM's code itself. And so the reason it's considered like ring negative two is because if the BIOS says lock everyone else out of SMM, then that means a hypervisor is not allowed to read the memory of SMM and an OS is not allowed to read it. But the SMM is allowed to read, you know, all of physical memory. So it's like SMM can access all of physical memory, which means all of the OS's memory, all of the hypervisor's memory, 
but the hypervisor and OS are not allowed to read its memory just based on this uh, locked state. So that's why SMM is considered red negative too, because it can you know, modify all that stuff above it, but they can't modify it. All right, then going lower, ring native kind of 2.5 is uh, BIOS or EFI, sensible firmware interface. So newer systems use EFI or Macs use EFI and uh, older systems use BIOS. And so the point of BIOS or EFI, it's a sort of firmware where immediately on system reboot, uh, your CPU gets set to a default state, your north bridge gets set to a default state, your south bridge gets set to a default state. The North Bridge, again, is the guy who access, who mediates all access to RAM. South Bridge accesses all of the slower peripherals that are connected to the North Bridge. So, uh, John was an example of something like that. South Bridge sort of thing. What are some of those buses on the South Bridge? Oh, yeah, low pin count. Yeah. So there's a low pin count where the BIOS actually is. What about like PS2? Is that down there? Oh, no. yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. I can't remember any of the uh, slower stuff. But basically, slower stuff is typically on the south bridge, and the fast stuff is on the north bridge. But um, the BIOS, when your system gets reset, it's reset into a state where the CPU accesses a specific, ver uh, specific memory address as the first instruction that it's going to execute. But because the north bridge and the south bridge are reset, that memory, that quote, you know, memory access where it's trying to look for an instruction, that just gets redirected down the north bridge and instead of going out to memory, well, I'll, I'll drop it real quick. Alright, so when your CPU gets reset, it's looking for, uh, trying to look for instructions at F, 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 zero, this memory address. But these things get reset so that whereas normally the North Bridge would say, oh, you're looking for that, you know, memory address. Okay, I'll redirect you out to RAM and you can go and read that memory address. But when it's in a reset <coughs> state, for that specific address range where that resides, it basically uh, redirects it down. Uh, through the north bridge, goes to the south bridge, and the south bridge redirects to the BIOS. So that the very first instruction that the CPU executes, it reads in from the BIOS, which uh, this, this BIOS uh, memory gets, you know, it's, quote, mapped to memory, but it's more like all of the memory accesses are mapped to the BIOS. So the CPU gets instructions from the BIOS, it starts executing them. The BIOS is then, you know, supposed to do the initialization of the system. It's supposed to check whether you even have any RAM installed right now. It's supposed to go out and initialize peripherals. And eventually when it's done, it goes and it says, okay guys, I'm done. You know, you can you know, cancel that out. You don't have to redirect me anymore. And you don't have to redirect me anymore. So, you know, stuff can go back to work. So that's the BIOS job. But the reason why we consider this uh, more privileged than system management work, for instance, is because uh, inside of the BIOS is, you know, a little bit of code, this system management mode code where it takes that and it puts it in memory and it sets all the relevant bits to say, okay, this is going to be the, the instructions which are used when a system management interrupt occurs, and then I want these locked down. So basically, if you control the BIOS, then you control system management mode, and system management mode can control everything else. So just a cascading sort of effect there. And similarly, you know, the BIOS reset, when the BIOS is really totally done, it goes and it reads the master boot record in from disk and it like just goes ahead and passes off to that. So same thing where controlling the BIOS, you could manipulate the master boot record data before you pass control to it and then do the equivalent of a boot kit but without having to change the stuff on the hard drive. So that's uh, why the BIOS is sort of ring negative 2.5. And finally, ring negative 3, uh, chipset based. So I'll go back to this picture. Chipset based is actually where you're subverting this north bridge here. And so I said that, for instance, the SMM, um, the SMM gets put into RAM in a certain location, then you lock it down, you know, quote, lock it down. But the thing that actually does the enforcement of locking is the north bridge the chipset, which uh, is the thing that says, is someone trying to access the SMM? And then they say, is this the SMM itself? No. All right, disallow. Or, you know, the PCI is over here, 
and this is trying to do DMA. This is trying to do DMA to talk directly to this RAM and you know read data in and out. Uh, again, controlling this controls that capability, controls the SMM lock, things like that. So I'll show a quick uh, picture of that later. But, um, Intel has a technology called active management technology. And what they've actually done is they've implemented, so this North Bridge is actually a completely separate CPU. Uh, well, you can call it a CPU or just a microprocessor or whatever you want to call it. Whereas this is the x86 thing that we talked about in all these classes. This is a separate kind of uh, chip called an ARC4. And so with this active management technology, Intel has actually implemented, made this quite a bit more complicated in that it has, um, so out here, out here on the PCI bus, you've got your network interface card and stuff like that. And so this AMT code actually knows how to talk directly to the NIC on you know this specific Intel CPU, or sorry, this particular you know specific Intel motherboard combination of NICs and Northridge and CPUs and all that. AMT knows how to talk to the NIC, and so it allows. Um, there's sort of I can't remember them all, but there's sort of like three levels of capabilities for AMT. One is you go into a you know full shutdown sort of state. It's it's ostensibly full shutdown in that you shut down your CPU and it's no longer executing code. You know this thing is completely powered off, but this thing is still powered on and this thing can still receive commands over the NIC. And this is meant to be used by remote administrators where you know let's say this entire lab of machines is turned off for the weekend. But there's an emergency patch and we must you know install. ASAP and the administrator just wants to get it over with. He knows it's going to take, you know, two hours or something. So he comes in and he uses AMT and he can actually go talk to all these and turn the things on. So this isn't like wake on LAN. So we know that wake on LAN is just where the NIC is sort of, where the system is kind of sleeping and it will resume from a sleep state. This is like actually the CPU is powered off and, but the NIC and the AMT are still sort of running and they're still just consuming a little bit of power on this the special uh, ARC4 processor. And so you can actually say, okay, turn this thing on. And then you can do things like, after the thing is into a turn on state, then you can start doing things like, okay, mount the CD and start, you know, an install process and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's meant for remote administration and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, I think you'll start seeing some more use of AMT come out of the uh, McAfee Intel merger, you know, sort of one of the many points of that was, hey, we Intel said, hey, we've got all these sort of security technologies and other things that we're putting into hardware, but no one's using them. So let's build a, let's buy a security company and, you know, highly encourage them to use our techniques and give them, you know, full documentation and everything, and then they'll start using it. But anyways, uh, there's a there's a talk that we'll show just one quick slide from later about. Uh, subverting AMT and getting attacker code to be able to uh, run in the context of that processor and therefore obviously you know you can control SMM and control DMA and control all of the hypervisor's memory and OS's memory and all that but of course for each of these things you know it's worth saying that as you go lower and lower in this picture you're obviously removing a bunch of abstractions from yourself, right? So in user space, you've got all these libraries that are given by the kernel. So, you know, you just call create file and it just happens magically, right? You go lower into the OS, well, you've still got uh, create file equivalents in the OS. Go into the hypervisor, maybe you've still got something that's more limited. You're not maybe reading a file system of guest OS. Maybe you're just reading full guest OS files at a time. But you start getting into, you know, master boot record and you have to, like, start reading the hard drive sector by sector and putting together files. And, you know, pretty much everything else from lower down, you know, system management mode. It doesn't know what a process it is. It just knows here's a block of physical memory. I better, you know, look for some springs in that that I think is uh, related to data I want to compromise. So it's worth saying that in each of these things, you go way down low. It's harder to detect them. And they potentially can, and that means they can potentially persist for longer. But they also have much more complicated uh, implementation requirements because they've removed all of the abstraction layers, and therefore they must build those abstraction layers at least targeting the specific thing. So if they want to send a packet from the chipset, you know, well, in AMT's case, it may be easier because it's already meant to build send packets from the chipset. But you know, other places like system management mode are not necessarily meant to do that. So you have to 
you know, write your own write your own driver that talks to the specific hardware and all that sort of thing. So, so you go lower, it's harder to detect, but you also, it's harder to build. It requires more expertise and you have less abstractions. All right. Any questions on this before I go on? This is just one sort of taxonomy here in terms of you know, the lower you go, the more privileges you have. You can control pretty much everything above. Any questions on that? Yes. Do we see stuff in the wild with <coughs> all of these negative ring levels? No. So most of them are just sort of proof of concept things that have been uh, talked about in, you know, black hat talks and stuff like that. Um, I'm not even sure if we've seen ring native one in the wild. I can't think of any examples of that. Doesn't mean I just haven't been, you know, looking for it or paying attention. Um, and I'll come back to that later. Um, boot kits we have seen in the wild, absolutely. So ring negative 1.5. Uh, we do see boot kits in the wild. Uh, but things like system management mode and BIOS, well, BIOS, uh, theoretically, one, well, anything there. That's all I'll say. Any other questions? All right. So that's one level of taxonomy. This is another um, by Joanna Rakowska. And so this was sort of trying to get around the issue of, you know, the fact that rootkit means many things to many people. And so instead she's just saying, let's focus on, you know, if the point. So you can see how rootkits fall into a stealth malware taxonomy because I said that rootkits, as far as I'm concerned, they're about hiding the attacker on the system. So that's about stealth, right? But there's different ways that you can hide on the system. Um, and there's different capabilities you're going to be using. So type 0 means you're only using legitimate uh, features on the system and you're not you know, changing anything about the system at all. And so, the, the, well, I'll get into each of these in more detail in one second. So type 0 just uses whatever functionality is there. It doesn't change anything. Just, you know, potentially hides in plain sight, essentially. So, you know, if I've got a file hidden deep in the system and the administrator doesn't know to go look for it, well, that's potentially stealth malware, right? Uh, type 1, then, is malware which modifies things on the system, in the operating system, to hide itself. But it modifies things which should be static. So it means that's sort of like what I was talking about when I was showing those detectors. Some of them can roll back changes for different categories. And that's typically this, if there's type 1 type changes. So the malware comes in there and say, you know, I want this, this function which usually always points at, uh, this function pointer which usually always points at the you know, core operating system, NTOS kernel, not exe or something. They say, I want that to point at my code instead. But because that should always be pointing at NTOS kernel, uh, it's clear that, that that's a sort of static thing and modifying that will be fairly easy to detect. Type 2, on the other hand, is where, you know, malware people started recognizing, you know, for, for each rootkit person who came up with a new pr proof of concept technique, you know, they saw pretty quickly that, okay, well, when I describe this to you, you now can just go look for it, right? So they started saying, okay, what about can I change things which should be changing naturally? So they're just, you know, maybe there's many possible states for something. Maybe there are things which, you know, are being created and destroyed and stuff like that. And maybe I can manipulate that in order to still achieve my you know, self malware goals. Uh, and then therefore the defender can no longer just say that should be this fixed value. And then it makes it much harder on the defender in order to find that type of malware. And then finally, type 3 is something where it exists actually outside the operating system. And so where she was going with this is that this was, 2006 was around when she was, uh, you know, coming up with the idea for the ring negative 1 new kits where she was saying, you know, I want to use the hardware support for virtualization. And I'm going to, like, actually jump outside the operating system. I will be a hypervisor. And then theoretically, I will control everything that goes on in the guest OS. So you should never be able to see me. Right? And that's not actually the case, but but uh, but that for purposes of this taxonomy, if you're sort of you know really outside of the place where the defender should be looking, it's sort of more about you know if the defender is looking for operating system subversion. If you're somehow completely outside of the operating system, then uh, then that's one way to be stealth, right? You're still maybe manipulating the operating system from the outside, but uh, but it makes it harder for the defender there. All right, so some examples of type 0 malware are things like spyware, Trojan bots, things that hide in plain sight. So you say, you know, if it's, 
these capabilities don't necessarily focus so much on the hiding aspect of things other than the last one, but but it's just worth saying that, you know, for something like a botnet, if it has the capability to do a DDoS attack, there's nothing illegitimate about the ability to open up a network socket and send some packets, right? It's only when you know, you send it at maximum rate and when it's combined with a bunch of other stuff that that becomes something we consider malicious. But, uh, but, but it's just using functionality built into the system. So, so really where the stealth side comes in is the hiding in plain sight. So, and, you know, Stuxnet is actually a good example of this. So Stuxnet kind of, it's a, diff a few different levels here, but the driver files for Stuxnet were like mrxnet.sys, I think, was one of them, and something else, mrx class. I, I can't remember which one's legitimate, which one's not. The point was, on a normal Windows system, there are things like mrxsmb.sys. That's like a legitimate Microsoft file. But Stuxnet named itself like a legitimate Microsoft file and just put itself into the services to start up like a legitimate Microsoft file. And so it wasn't actually trying to, to hide itself there on disk or anything. Gambling on the fact that, you know, it looks like just another thing. And uh, as, as most of you saw with your homeworks, if you run rootkit detector and you're hiding your files, that, you know, shows up as a big red flag very easily. So in some cases, it may be better to actually be type zero, just try to blend in with the system rather than change anything about the system. Now, they did hide the exploit files and stuff like that on the USB disks. They were hiding those files, but not actually the service which persisted on the system. All right, so detecting type zero was basically out of scope for the taxonomy and also for this class. When something is actually just sort of hiding in plain sight and not actually changing anything about the system, well, that comes back to where you kind of have to know what should or shouldn't be on your system, right? So you know, some of these sort of things can help with that. There's, you know, obviously antivirus can find known things that shouldn't be on your system. Uh, file system integrity checking is, you know, the flip side. That's sort of whitelisting where you're saying, I'm going to take everything that I think should be on my system, put it in a list, and anything new that gets added, I need to check that. And so, you know, that sort of thing would have found uh, Stuxnet at two levels. It would have found that uh, the new addition of those system files it would have also found their trojaning of the DLL later on. But and then there's also behavioral analysis and things like that.